One of the most persistent ideas in the politics of the West, whether we're talking about Europe or the United States, is that government debt is best attacked through reducing government spending. But this week's guest warns that austerity, as such plans are known, is a historically dangerous idea. He's Mark Blythe this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. Alongside me is my friend and co-host, G. Wayne Miller from the Providence Journal. Story in the Public Square is an effort to study, celebrate, and tell stories that matter. We do that by visiting each week with the best contemporary storytellers, authors, scholars, filmmakers, and journalists, really anyone using or studying narrative to explain the world in which we live. This week, we're joined by Mark Blythe, a political economist at the William R. Rhodes Center for International Economics and Finance at the Watson Institute at Brown University. He's also the author of a 2013 book titled simply, Austerity, The History of a Dangerous Idea. Mark, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for the invitation. So uh, your expertise is political economy for the uninitiated at home. Uh, what does that mean? What does that mean? It's what economics started as. It's what Adam Smith tried to do. It's what David Ricardo, even Karl Marx tried to do. It's getting away from the rather abstract, but useful sometimes mathematical models that economists usually use, and trying to use history, culture, thinking about things like narrative, how they matter in politics, how they affect our lives, and trying to bring all that together in a rigorous way. Now, uh, you, in a couple of different places, I've seen you refer to your, your role as a scholar in part as being the BS police, and I've cleaned that up for our audience. Yes. Um, explain what you mean by that. So the job of scholars in many ways, apart from producing new knowledge, is stress testing existing knowledge. So you could say stress testing if you want. I prefer the BS police. <laughs> Basically, we say, here's an idea. OK, that smells OK. Here's an idea about something else. No, I'm sorry, that doesn't pass the sniff test. And our job is to essentially say, to the best of our ability, what's real and what's not. So your, your book, Austerity, The History of a Dangerous Idea, debunks the myth that austerity is common sense. In the subtitle, you actually call it a dangerous idea. Let's break that down. Um, in its most basic sense, what is austerity? The proposition that when the economy hits the skids, usually because of a financial crisis or some other big shock that causes a recession, what the government needs to do is to tighten its belt and stop spending. That will restore the confidence of investors and the recession will be shorter, unemployment will be lower, and we'll get out of it faster. And that's not, this is not some hypothetical uh, oh, no. theoretical concept. This, is, this dominates This politics. is what they did to Greece. Right. This is what they did to southern Italy. This is what we did in the 1930s that brought about Nazism. We keep doing it. It's a dangerous idea because no amount of empirical refutation ever gets rid of it. It won't die. So, so why, is it, why is it viewed by so many people as common sense? Like, yeah, that's what we do. Well, think about it. If you're a family and you spend too much, you stop spending. It's completely different for the government because the government prints the thing that it then asks you to pay back at the end of the year. I mean, rather different, right? Uh, I don't get to issue bonds. There's no such thing as the blithe 25-year family bond that investors all around the world want to hold, and there's never been a failed auction for treasuries. Imagine if I tried it. I bet there'd be a few failed auctions. Uh, as a credit risk, I'm pretty good, right? Tenure professor at a good school, I'm good for a mortgage. I will die. The United States doesn't die. So you have intragenerational credit claims, which are redeemable. All of that's massively different from the position of a family. So you get this, uh, Angela Merkel played this one, the Schwabian housewife. She understands how the economy works. Really? Your economic advisor is a Schwabian housewife. Good luck with that, right? <laughs> but here's another way to think about it, right? So the public debt, public debt, $17 trillion. Well, you know, the economy is $18 trillion. Sounds like a big number, right? So $17 trillion is a big number, okay. So should we cut it in half? So imagine you get rid of half the debt. Sounds like a good idea, right? What you're saying is, I want to destroy half of public savings because the public debt is, so you say, private savings. 
they're actually equivalent. What do you think a bond is? It's people buying it because they want security and liquidity and an interest payment. It's a savings bond. So when you say you want to reduce the debt, you're saying you want to destroy private savings. And if you do that, the bottom of the credit pyramid that allows you to buy a mortgage evaporates. So do you want to pay more for your mortgage? Because you will if you pay back half the debt. Not only that, all the international investors who are long dollar assets will freak out and start dumping them. So we actually need to think a little bit better than a Schwabian housewife. I mean, this all makes sense to me hearing you talk about it now, but there, it's almost a mantra, reduce the national debt. Debt is a bad thing. Debt, debt, That's because politicians blah. do mantras. They gave up thinking a long time ago. I did congressional testimony a couple of years ago, and it was for, uh, let's, bring a, let's do a balanced budget. And I sat there and patiently told everyone with charts and data and all the rest of it why you shouldn't do this. It's a really bad idea. And half the room went, yeah, that makes sense. And half the room went, nah, that's nonsense. And, and that's that, it. And, and it's our it. polarized politics. It's all theater. So um, one of the arguments in your book is that uh, austerity is not a way of promoting growth. Ex elaborate on that a little bit for so us. So the only way it could be a, a way of promoting growth is the following. So you have a big recession and the people that matter in this world are investors. And investors see the economy going down and they're like, okay, I'm not going to invest, right? Now, investment is the primary thing in capitalism. Without investment, no wages, no jobs, no growth. So that's important. So why then do you say, well, if the government stops spending, That'll make the investors confident. Because think about it. So imagine that we divide the economy, any economy in the world, at any point in the world, into three sectors. You've got households, you've got businesses, and you've got government. So what's a recession? A recession is when households are losing money. And if they're worried about the future, they start saving. So companies are worried about the future. So they start laying off workers, and then they try and spend less. They're effectively saving. So the only thing spending is the government. So the government starts to not spend, it saves. What's got to happen to the economy overall? It's got to shrink. Now, it's counterintuitive, but just think along that logic. You really are saying you want to shrink the economy in order to make people more confident. Once you break it down, it doesn't really make that much sense. You don't have to be, don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure this one out. Right? If you're in the middle of a recession and your wife loses her job, uh, are you going to go, well, thank goodness, 30 years from now, the welfare state will be smaller and I'll be making smaller tax payments? <laughs> well, no, but you can write a model that gets you there. And that's what we do because we want to get to the conclusion. We've already decided where we want to be, then we make the argument to fit. So you, you've touched on this a bit already, but how does this concept, concept of, of austerity affect American politics, and particularly in the current era, which is the era you know, we can define as from the election of Donald Trump to president until now. Well, here's a go back to that example of three sectors, right? Yeah. So you've got American households, American businesses, and the government. So the government doesn't spend any money that isn't basically tied up in long-term programs like defense or social security. So everybody in principle agrees infrastructure is terrible, one third of bridges are at risk of falling down, we need to do something. The president comes out with a big infrastructure thing, it goes nowhere, right? We don't spend. Now look at American corporates. They haven't made this much profit in possibly 35 years. Uh, Apple alone sits on a cash pile that's twice the size of the cash reserves of Goldman Sachs. So they're net savers. Even if they are invested, they're net savers. Governments are spending, they're savers. So what's the only part of the economy that's spending? Consumers. Yeah. And consumers are up to here in debt and stressed out in their jobs. You think, when you think about that, that might explain a lot about where our politics are? So you know, so I want to push this a little bit because you, you, when you t when you when you talked about the the why austerity is a dangerous idea, you talked about the experience in the 1930s. You talked about the rise of fascism in Europe. Is there a, a is there a link between the austerity that we've seen preached in Europe in the last 15 years and the rise of populist and far right parties in Absolutely. Europe? Absolutely, and there's two there's there's two variants. In the north, you have nationalist right wing parties. And in the south of Europe, what you've got typically are left-wing parties. And now, oddly enough, <laughs> given the Euro crisis, the ones in the south are all the debtors, and the ones in the north are all the creditors. Now, let's think about that for a minute. You're on a decade-long experiment in austerity, not spending to cure a recession. Europe just got back to where it was economically in 1997. Unemployment in the south is still 20% for adults and 40% for people around the age of 25 to 35. Right? This is a scandal. Now, do you think that might have an effect on politics? And if you're in a debtor's country, what do you want to do? You want to default. Well, that's pretty much a lefty response. Mm -hmm. And if you're up in the north and all you've been told is those lazy Greeks, and now we have all these migrants coming in, 
What do you think the reaction is going to be, particularly if you've been somebody who lives, for example, in the eastern part of Germany, lives in public housing, has been there for 20 years, is constantly told that they're a drain on the state, that there's no more money for them, that we need to tighten our belts, and suddenly you're giving money to Greeks and you're bringing in migrants. It's not that difficult to explain. It doesn't seem like, though, that it's going to end well. Well, uh, let's just say the path to the future is always open. Uh, I'm heartened by the fact that Europe no longer squeezes itself in terms of trying to improve itself. If you look at what the European Commission is trying to do now, they're doing some pretty good stuff. There's a lot of investment going on in Europe through Juncker Plan, it's what's called the Juncker Plan. But overall, there's, there's a problem. And you know the problem is the politics have become incredibly polarized. Another problem is these are actually incredibly old societies. Pop quiz for the both of you, right? What's the age of the average Italian? 41. 47. Wow. Yeah, 46 on the border, 47. So Japan, Italy, Germany, incredibly old societies. What happens with old rich societies, they save too much. So then you end up with very low interest rates, low consumption, low inflation. Sounds like where they are. Mm -hmm. So then how do they make money? They send the money abroad and invest it somewhere else. Greece. You can see how this cycle works. So how do you change this narrative? You've testified in front of Congress. You've written about this. You're here on this program. How do you change this narrative? This narrative is so entrenched, I would argue, in contemporary American life and European In the life. West. Yeah. And, yeah, in the West. How do you change that narrative so that people begin to have a real understanding of what's going I on think, as so opposed to... Yeah, so uh, I think that a, a lot of people do have a real understanding of what's going on, but... And in a sense, and obviously I'm not talking about this television program, but you know, there are sectors of <laughs> the media. I hope not, because we could end it right here. Exactly. <laughs> We're done at this good, point. Good, that was good it. move. It yeah. was been lovely. Thank you. Thank you for um, coming. Let's just say there are certain parts of the media that are, are hugely incentivized to tell a certain story mm. irrespective of the veracity of that story. And lots of people pick up on this because humans, being sort of the way we've evolved, love things that conform to our prejudices. It's a tiny little dopamine rush. It's like looking at your phone, right? Mm -hmm. So if you happen to think X and somebody tells you X is totally true, you kind of feel good about it. So that's a hard thing to get over. Yes. But at the same time, we learn, we change, we actually are able to adapt. So there are lots of examples around the world of relatively successful non-polarized countries, as well as the ones that have fallen this way. And you know the, the, the nice thing about history is that it doesn't actually repeat itself. It, it might rhyme, it might echo, but it doesn't repeat itself. The notion that Germany is going to tool up, build tanks, and invade France never going <laughs> to happen, right? Is there a proper solution to the fact that lots of people in East Germany are nationalistically charged up at the moment? Yeah, there is. How about basically not treating them like welfare recipients that need to be disciplined for the prior 10 years? How about giving them some skills? How about giving them some mobility, some opportunity? That might work. You, you, so you raised a, an interesting issue there. That, so I, I look at the, the media coverage of the economy in the United States six months before uh, Election Day 2016 <laughs> and the first six months of the Trump presidency. Mm -hmm. And you know, uh, uh, did, from a data perspective, there's not a huge difference between those two. But on let's name names, Fox in particular, the media narrative yeah. changed fundamentally, right? From Absolutely. what was the failing Obama economy, same numbers 12 months later, and it's the roaring Trump economy. Yeah. And I have to believe that that different narrative mm -hmm. shapes the way the public Absolutely. feels, not just the way they spend. Couldn't agree more. So, you know, this is, my first book was called Great Transformations, and basically it's about how this played out in the 1930s and the 1970s. And it, it's absolutely fundamental. I mean, the world's an incredibly complex and confusing place. So when economists talk about people of interests, right, what do they mean by that? They mean that somehow they understand uh, their wealth, their longevity, the sector that they operate in. They can calculate lifetime income streams. Like, nobody behaves like this. We're <laughs> short-sighted, myopic, and we like stories. So when things are confusing, when things start to fall apart, we love the story that clarifies for us, but also appeals to our prejudice. Mm -hmm. So the 1970s is a crisis of inflation. Take that as a fact. Who was causing it? Right? Was it uh, American deployment in Vietnam, the collapse of the dollar, the oil shock? Or was it greedy trade unions? Or was it both in combination? Which part do you want to highlight? Right? Was the Euro crisis this epic piece of economic mismanagement, this tragedy of a decade? Was that because we were saving German banks from their own errors? Or was it the fact that societies like Greece basically were 
fundamentally flawed in the way that they put themselves together and the fact that they didn't collect any taxes and they had too much debt. Which bit do you want to highlight? That's always narrative. It's always framing. That's why the political presupposes and shapes the economic. So we live in a great social media time where people click, find something, read it quickly, click, click, click. How does that and send it on? And it's send it on. And it goes to the larger issue here of being more informed and, and maybe taking the time to, to read and go somewhere else besides Fox or CNN or wherever you're going. Mm -hmm. uh, talk about that, that, how social media has changed fundamentally how we, how we tell stories mm -hmm. and how we relay and repeat stories. Well, I'm, and you know, this is where I'm absolutely not qualified to talk about this because I'm not on Facebook. There's a Facebook site with my picture, <laughs> with my name on it that the last time I saw it had a picture of some Italian model on the front. And that's <laughs> not, me. So, not me. So I, I use Twitter. You. I use Twitter, but I only ever tweet out. I very seldom respond because I don't think you can actually meaningfully communicate in whatever number of characters it is, right? So I think there's a way in which these things are useful tools, but when to me the interesting one is Facebook. Right? So Facebook is essentially a sharing platform. Well, you know, you think it's your kids' pictures but it's also basically propaganda. Mm -hmm. It's also news items, which don't check the veracity of. Now, 15 of your friends have liked a news item. Are you going to be the one that doesn't like it? So there are the ways in which this whole sort of, let's say, evolutionary psychology of being in a group and being with friends and how that helps us actually counts against us in terms of the way that sort of unfiltered media, or I won't even call it news, unfiltered media is processed. So it, it's a very, very big issue. And of course, it cuts across generations in different ways. For young people, Instagram, way more than Facebook. For old people who are stuck at home, who basically spend a lot of time on the computer, Facebook. And there's different possibilities for each of those media. So it certainly made it more complex, certainly made it more interesting. I want to come back for a second, though, to the, the question of austerity. Is debt not a problem? Well, let's think about it this way. The bank of Japan, oh, not the bank, Japanese economy, right? Oldest economy in the world. Right? They are now, I think they blew it out to 230% of GDP. Mm -hmm. Their debt. Their debt, yeah. right? Now, when you net it out, it's actually lower than that. And since 2012, the Bank of Japan's basically been buying every bond that's issued. Because guess what? It's a financial asset. And there's no inflation, and they seem to be doing fine. They're not going to fall into the sea. They might all die of old age, but that's going to take a couple of hundred years. Um, so they're fine. Now, if you're Venezuela and you basically have one asset, which is oil, you run it into the ground, you have astonishing levels of corruption and cronyism, polarization and violence. Yeah, debt's a problem. Who's going to buy your debt? Mm -hmm. But if you're a Japanese household, why would you not? It's an intergenerational gift to your kids. And in the case of the American debt? So the American debt's even more interesting. Look, imagine this. You're China. Everybody's worried about China. Mm -hmm. So what does China do? China makes stuff that we used to make. It's actually American companies that do this, by the way. They move to China. Right, again, yeah. you know. So the whole notion is Chinese firms isn't true. But anyway, so American companies move to China or subcontract, they make stuff, and then it comes back to, let's say, Walmart. Right? Now, what happens? We pay them in dollars. A dollar goes to Shenzhen Supply Company, whatever. Right? They can't use that. They don't use dollars. So they have to take that to the bank. The bank can't use it because it's not domestic currency. So what do they do? They then turn it into some kind of useful asset. What's that called? What's the easiest thing to turn it into? A treasury bill. So in other words, we just wrote you a credit note for 30 years bearing 2% and you just gave me televisions. <laughs> right, now, what else are they going to buy? Are they going to buy Euro debt? Because Italy might leave and then the whole thing goes, <laughs> right? You're going to buy German debt. There isn't enough of it. You're going to buy Swiss debt. Good luck finding it. So basically the whole world has no alternative but to hold dollars. And we're worried about our debt? Oh. So what about, what about sort of the, the critics and you see some of these folks, particularly from uh, right-leaning national security think tanks, say that, well, the debt's a national security risk because if China decides not, not to buy our bonds, then they're going to have us over Is this over the bit where I can bang my head off the tail? Sure. The <laughs> right. uh, last time it's I not too loud. We don't want our audience to get startled. Last time I checked, 17% of bonds, no, well, it depends on Canada. Let's say 30% of bonds are held by foreigners, right? Mm -hmm. I think 17% are held by China. That's mm -hmm. a good deal. Remember I said that thing called a debt is also called a savings bond, right? So the Chinese have taken all the profits from Walmart and put them into the safest asset in the world called the dollar. So let's say I want to detonate the dollar. What have I just done? Just I have destroyed all of my savings. And while that would certainly hurt us because the Treasury would need to buy it back and that would probably affect the exchange rate and the interest rates, etc., they've just blown up national savings. 
to prove a point. It would be like, I'm really cross with you because you hurt me. You called me a rude name. I'm now going to shoot myself in the head. <laughs> <laughs> that would literally be the equivalent of this. So, but, no, this but, but there's, doesn't make but sense. There, but there are people who say that's the worst possible thing that could happen. They make China the bogeyman. It's like, we have to get rid of, we, Chinese cannot hold our debt. Why not? The more, I'm, I'm, the, the more debt they hold, the better. I'm because saying this is what some people yeah. believe, though. Well, well, that's true. It, is My daughter believes in unicorns. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily put any purchase How in that. How old is your daughter? She's six. Okay. That's <laughs> fine. Yeah. But no. Yeah. Just no. So it doesn't make any sense. We, we, we no, talk, it doesn't. We talked a little bit about the, uh, uh, the link between the, the, the political evolution in Europe and policies of austerity. Put Donald Trump into that context for us. All right, so here's an interesting one. Um, Wisconsin, let's take Wisconsin. Uh, Democrats who live on the coast who earn $100,000 or more call these flyover states because they never stop there. You just go from one side to the other. And if I lived in Wisconsin, I got more than a little bit resentful about that. Now, if you go back to the 1970s, Wisconsin was a big industrial state and it lost one third of its industry, not to Mexico, but to Texas and other southern right to work states because you wanted to not pay union rates. So a third of it went that way. All right, so then you've got to adjust to that, your wages going down. Then you get into the era of NAFTA, and that certainly has an impact. And then you get into China joining the WTO. And if you look very concentrated at a district level, like towns that basically specialize in things like toys, furniture, or whatever, not necessarily just in Wisconsin, but also mm -hmm. around in Ohio Valley, et cetera, right? When China joined the WTO, they got wiped out. You can go at the Federal Reserve St. Louis database and look at capacity utilization for American industries. If you've got 80% capacity, you have an industry. There are the industries in there, like 2001 comes along, they're down at 30% five years later. Mm. So just imagine a series of just economic shocks. Add into this automation, computerization, the digital revolution, right? Ten years ago, Wisconsin had some of the best roads in the country. This year, it's got the third worst. The University of Wisconsin used to be one of the top five research schools all the time. Now it's not. So there's a thing economists call in the delta. Delta is the rate of change. And what you find with Brexit, what you find with constituents that went for Trump, that voted for Obama twice, and there were many of those districts, is that it's not the fact that they're suddenly poor. That will hurt and that will help. It's the fact there's a feeling they've been on the skids for a long time. And if you have that feeling and you feel that the other people who are meant to represent you fly over you, mm -hmm. why are you going to listen to what they've got to say? So what's the political antidote? What, what is a smart progressive politician do to, to take this head on? There's a big difference between understanding what drives Trump's voters and sympathizing with Trump and his policies. And if you do not take it seriously that these people have real and legitimate grievances and it's not just all racism, because then you have to explain something very weird, why it is that a huge number of counties in the five states that fell, the blue wall, voted for Obama not just once but twice because they all suddenly become racist, mm -hmm. right? So that's obviously part of it. We simply need to, uh, I went to see the movie Black Klansman, shout out for that, it's a fantastic film. But at the end, the way that it plugs in what happened in uh, Charlottesville is incredible. Let's not downplay this, but let's not reduce everything to that. Because then you can't explain why you have left-wing populism in Europe, mm -hmm. right? There's a whole series of these cases. This is a global phenomenon, not just one thing. And it comes basically from the interaction of three things. Number one, you've had a massive increase in inequality. You've had a massive increase in people's felt sense of fragility, that their life chances have been altered. The, I'll give you an example, a terrifying story. A month ago, a woman falls off the Green Line platform in Boston. You know about this mm -hmm. one? And she splits her leg open, like skin, bone, the whole lot. She's in agony. People run towards her to help her, start making a call. She shouts out, for God's sake, don't call an ambulance. That's $3,000. I can't afford that. <laughs> now, when you've built a society that's that tightly wound and that fragile, whereby there are people at the top who literally have made off with everything over the past 30 years. Lots of different narratives will explain that, but all of them will be polarizing. And what Trump did was walk right into the middle of that and capture it because the mainstream political parties were utterly oblivious to it because they spent 10 years talking to each other about how wonderful the world was at Davos seminars. <laughs> Nobody went to Wisconsin to find out what it was like 10 years ago and now. And what Trump did was walk into the middle of that and say, yeah, you guys, you're not so hot on trade, are you? Yeah, and what about this, and what about that? And that coalition just came to him. What do you see for the midterm elections? In uh, the, in again, this this, I, I try not to talk about things that I'm not an expert in, 
but I think a lot of people project from primaries, and primaries are when people who like the party vote. Yeah. I don't think that tells you a great deal about what happens in actual elections. A lot has to do with turnout. A lot has to do with gerrymandering on the Republican side, which has made it harder for Democrats to win. There's the whole schism in the Democrats between the so-called centrists and the populists. So there's a lot of variables at play. I think the safe one is this. I would not expect them to do as well as they think they're going to do. We only have a couple of minutes left. Quickly. 45 seconds. 45 seconds. You, you write that you, were, you grew up in relative poverty. Yeah. How did you get here from relative poverty in Scotland? Because I'm a welfare kid. Because what a welfare state does is it takes people who have the ability to succeed and gives them the means to succeed. And that way I was able to go to a school, and that school had middle class kids in it too. So then it wasn't ghettoized or whatever you want to call it. Then there were positive role models and you were exposed to sports that were things that you weren't just doing in your backyard. Maybe you got away through that. There was an expectation that you went to college, even if nobody in your family had ever done so before. And there was the means. You weren't burdened with debt. I was given not only free fees, I was given a grant. Now, ah, that's great. Oh, how are you going to pay for that? Well, in my lifetime, I have paid back about 10 times as much tax as it costs to do all that because I'm now a high earner. So when this is done right, it pays for itself, which is why when anybody says to me, welfare is a waste of time, they're telling me I'm a waste of time. A powerful point to leave it on. Mark Blythe, the book is Austerity. Thank you so much for being with us. That's all the time we have this week, but if you want to know more about storing the public square, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter or visit PellCenter.org. He's Wayne, I'm Jim. We hope you'll join us again next time for more Story in the Public Square.